evening to everybody. Um, I'd like to give you a bit of an insight into EME, Moonbound, and my journey from starting out as a dream, way right back in the 70s, to reality, which is the present day. A little bit about myself. I first became interested in radio as a teenager. Uh, joined the Scunthorpe Club. I uh, lived near Scunthorpe, uh, between Scunthorpe and Lincoln. Uh, started as a shortwave listener. Uh, first became licensed in 1971 as G8 GPC. Passed the Morse test and became G4 CCH in 1973. Uh, my interest in Moon Bounce was sparked by the late G3CCH, who was a uh, pioneer doing Moon Bounce, uh, meter scatter, all kinds of stuff on the uh, VHF and UHF bands, and uh, G3LTF. Um, they were doing tests in the 1970s with the big dish at Arecibo, KP4 BPZ, a thousand foot dish. Uh, my interest areas are construction in the RF uh, arena, VHF and up. I'm not really interested in the HF bands. Um, I've got no gear for the HF bands apart from the transceiver, no antennas, nothing really. I'm not really interested. Um, started contesting in the 70s again, uh, built a station for 23 cents. And uh, we used to go out um, up to North Yorkshire near Filing Dales uh, and operate from up there until we got thrown off the site when the uh, when the new dome thing went up there. A truncated tetrahedron. Whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> so we didn't go there anymore. Um, obviously, Moon Bounce, the EME is, is obviously where it comes from. Uh, computers. Not because I'm interested, but because I need them to do other things, like track the moon and decode signals from the moon and other things, and tell people about what I'm interested in. Uh, there was going to be some sound there, but I think you know what it is. <laughs> uh, so what is moon bounce? Uh, basically. Two stations on either side of the world, or any, anywhere on the world that can see the moon at the same time, uh, can transmit a signal towards the moon, uh, it's reflected back and can be received by the other station. Um, but the, all the power that's transmitted, you only get 7% coming back. So there's quite a lot of loss on reflection, and there's also something called path loss consider, which on 23 cents, which is the band I'm interested in, is something like 270 dB, uh, plus or minus about 3 dB, depending on what time of the month it is. Um, so the signals always travel at 250,000 miles or thereabouts, and the time delay between transmitting and receiving the signal back is about two and a quarter seconds. That means that you can hear your own echoes. Um, if you can imagine the beam coming from this point, it's going to get wider as it comes towards the moon because you, your antenna's got a beam width it, which goes out like that. Well, the bigger it is, the more it actually misses the moon. Um, and if you've got a massive dish like Arecibo or one of the radio astronomy dishes, um, you end up in a situation where you're only hitting a small spot on the moon, which on the upper frequencies, the microwave bands can actually be detrimental. Too much gain and too little bandwidth results in less signal coming back, believe it or not. So why moon bounds? Uh, the possibility of worldwide QSLs on what we normally consider to be line of sight frequencies. So that's uh, 6 metres, 2 metres, 70 cents, 
23 sands and all the microwave bands up to 47 gigs so far. Uh, every QSO is the ultimate DX at 500,000 miles. <laughs> and it's a technical challenge, obviously. Uh, you, in order to do this, you need to set your mind to the project and decide how you're, how you're actually going to accomplish the, the challenge. Um, depending on what frequency you're going to go on, the challenge is different. Features of moon bounds are uh, that we're generally talking about weak signals. So it's beneficial if you can use CW and weak CW capability is what's required. Um, there's now something called JT65, which some people don't like, but nevertheless it's there. And that is a digital mode. So you're going to need to use a computer connected to your equipment. Um, and with JT65, it's actually possible to make QSLs that you wouldn't be able to make on CW. Um, the smallest station that I worked on JT65 is a 59 element Yagi with 100 watts. So that just goes to show what's possible. Prior to that, we're talking about an 8 volt dish and maybe 100, 200 watts. Uh, as I said before, you can receive echoes on CW and SSP. Uh, the moon, moon's orbit is elliptical, it takes 28 days to go around the Earth. Um, and activity tends to be concentrated around that time of the month when the moon is nearest to the Earth because the path loss is less. Uh, path loss varies in frequency, so on 2 metres it's less than it is on 23 sounds, and on 47 gigs it's much, much greater than it is on 23 sounds. Uh, we experience various effects, um, Doppler shift, vibration fading and polarisation rotation, which make things a bit more complicated. Uh, Doppler shift it's caused by the moon moving relative to the Earth. So it's a bit like the fleet car or the, um, the ambulance with his siren going, travelling down the road. Uh, as he's com coming towards you, it's going, do, 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 do. you know, that's the kind of effect we're, uh, we're going to experience when, when we do moon bounds. The amount of shift is proportional to the frequency and it depends on whether the moon is rising or setting. So, as the moon is rising, the reflected signals are always going to be higher than the transmitted signal. And as the moon is moving away from the zenith towards moon set, um, it's going to be lower. Um, the other one is vibration fading, which is a fluttery sort of fading, the signals tend to be chopped up a little bit, and that is caused by um, the moon wobbling in its orbit, um, and as we know the moon is just a chunk of rock, so any signals hitting the surface are going to be scattered off in all directions. You're going to get multiple reflections, um, and the wobbling effect causes some of the signals to add up and some of them to cancel. So the adding up ones sound louder, and the cancelling out ones obviously sound weaker. Um, just going back to Doppler shift. Um, there's an example of the kind of Doppler shift you can experience on the different bands. Um, so if you're on 13 sevens, 2320, then you're going to be experiencing plus or minus 5.6 kilohertz. So it does help if you've got plenty of RIT or a dual VFO transceiver. Um, 
rotation. It's also known as Faraday rotation. And it's caused by the Earth's magnetic field acting upon the plane of polarization. So if we got a horizontal signal coming from a, a Yagi, say, it's travelling away from the Earth, and as it leaves the Earth, the Earth's magnetic field causes the wave to the plane to twist until it hits the moon and then it reverses and comes back. Now depending where you are on the Earth, the effect can be different. Um, so it may it may start out in one polarization, but it will appear to somebody else maybe 45 degrees <coughs> or vertical. So people using Yagis have got a bit of a problem uh, because really they need to be able to rotate their Yagis to, to account for the signals that are coming at them. Uh, so this can cause what appear to be one way propagation effects. Um, the ideas need to be rotated on the receive to match the incoming signal. So you always transmit on the same polarisation and you receive on whatever it takes to pick the other station up. On a dish, you don't have that problem. Um, if, you, if you were on 77 say, where the norm is to work with the Yagis, and you've got a dish, then you can put the dipole at the focal, focal point of the dish and rotate that, not the whole dish. On 23 cents we use circular polarisation. Uh, the complicated bit is that the feed is actually polarised right circular on transmit and left circular on receive. So signal goes out like that, hits the moon and it comes back like that. And the feed is built in such a way that it can handle that. There are two parts on it, one for transmit and one for receive. So, the MAS essentials, as, as we said, CW ability, KT65, uh, high gain antenna, 20 dBi or greater, tracking system, so you've got to be able to track the moon, high power. I used to say 400 watts, but it's now down to 100. Uh, receiver systems are getting a lot better now, preamps are getting better. And of course, we've got the dreaded KT65, which helps quite a lot. That's how the QSO with M0 DTS, Peter. Oh, yeah. Two meter dish and 35 watts on KT65. Long nose receiver. Um, these days, it's quite possible to get below 0.3 dB nose figure. Uh, low feeder loss, so all this power that you're going to need, you want to get as much of it up to the antenna as possible with a minimum of loss. So you need to use some decent coax. And the stuff I use is 7 8 Heliax. Um, I could use bigger stuff, but uh, it's physically not possible to handle it. Not where I, where I am anyway. Uh, a lot of patience and determination. So how many people have we got on these various bands? So in, the, in making the decision to which band you're going to use, you, you want to really know who, who I'm going to be able to work. So there's the most popular bands. Obviously two metres is the most popular. 500 people approximately active worldwide. On 70 is 250, 23 sounds about 200, 13 sounds about 50, and on 3 sounds about 20. That's worldwide. In the UK, on the band that I use, 23 sounds, there are about 7 people. So which band? It really depends on your ability to build or acquire equipment. Um, obviously you've got to have the equipment in order to do the job but are you going to build it yourself or are you going to go and buy it? Uh, on some of the frequencies it's very difficult to buy the stuff off the shelf and even if you could it would be so expensive that you wouldn't want to do it. 
for example, a 500 watt PA from DB6 MT on 23 cents will cost you about £2,000. Um, so, and you could blow it up the first time you went on the air. So, I don't think you want to do that. So, um, obviously, the next thing is have you got enough room for the antenna that you want to put up? Um, depending on which band you go on, can you build a tracking system which will track the moon accurately enough so that the beam width of the antenna is, is, is concentrated on the moon all the time? What size is the antennas? Sorry? What size are the antennas physically? Right, the dish I'm using is 5.4 metres, 18 foot across. And the beam width is about 3 degrees to 3 dB points. Uh, so if you're 3 degrees off then you've lost a lot of signal. Uh, the ability to generate TX power, 100 watts or more, and who can I work? Um, there's some antennas. I'll do the G ones first. This is G4 DDKs. 2.3 metre dish, it's on 23 cents, with uh, what's becoming quite popular now, the septum feed. Uh, inside that square box, there is a piece of metal with sags out of it, basically, and that's what makes the circular polarisation. Uh, providing you can cut that piece of metal accurately enough, that will do the job. Um, it may not be optimum for your dish curvature, but the F over D, but there are things you can do about that. And it makes things a lot simpler when it comes to um, actually building a feed that works on 23 cents or any of the microwave bands. Uh, M0 DTS we're just talking about. This is uh, Rob's dish, <coughs> two metre dish, again the same feed. M3SPC. That started out as a 1.8 metre dish, but it grew to a 3.6. <laughs> 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 basically, basically, if neighbours don't complain, good lady. You can just about see there's a standard rotator at the bottom there. Mm. That's good enough for his 3.6 metre dish. DL3LCH. That's a 1.8 metre dish on the left, and that's his 59 element Yagi that he uses for expeditions. And he's been all over the place. Um, the last expedition was to Peru, and I worked him about two weeks ago from Peru, only one or six stations to, to make the cure myself. What's the um, presumably both antennas for say band? Yeah. What's the difference in beat weight and Power against the Yagi against well, the dish. Well, the dish will have more gain than the Yagi. Mm. The How much are we talking about? About um, 3 dB. <coughs> We're talking about 24 dB for the dish and 21 for the Yagi. BK7 That's his 2.2 metre dish on the balcony with his house. <coughs> Uh, in Tasmania. <coughs> PY2MJ, that's another one of these weak stations I worked on, JT65, 2 metre dish, 20 watts. And he's not even using a circular feed either, he's got a patch feed with the uh, horizontal polarisation. Um, the late G4 ERG. Um, we were talking about Yagi's and polarisation rotation. Well, he's actually got, he had a system where he could rotate the whole array. Um, well, you can see, but behind, behind here, there is actually an axis on which the whole array rotates. Uh, so 
So a tract that's horizontal, it receives whatever it takes to receive the signals coming back. Um, these are some silly ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> If you want to get going on two meters, say, and work somebody, and it might be the only QSO we ever have, then he's the man. Definitely. Yes, um, I had six of the ads and another one. <laughs> So you might get two PUSOs. <laughs> uh, W5UN, that's the long established one. I want to get two things here with the two meter beam stacked like this. Two things being is trying to get as much doubling as possible for this power. Yeah. As well as also a tie uh, yeah. beam. Yeah. Oh, well, those discs private, are they actually attached to some research institutions? And what dish? The ones that you showed, the three dishes. Ones. dishes. The three dishes, dishes, dishes are they? No, no, three are no, 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 they're private. All private. They're not private research institutions? No, not so. I'll show you some of them in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the next advanced advanced section? <laughs> I don't um, think he's getting room for the I'll go from the telephone through the estates. Yeah. I'll go to 10 gigs now. There's one station in the UK is on 10 gigs BME, and that's PW4 DGU, right. and it's using a 2.4 metre disc with a uh, travelling wave tube, which is actually in that box. Um, I forget how much it's, it's running about 40 watts. Now, look, sometimes you can get access to these professional antennas. And um, here's some examples. Um, I'll show you That's the Arecibo uh, with 10 watts you can work in enough problem. The very rarely I've got a fit 150 foot dish. Now, I'm not sure whether that's still running or not, but that was used in about 2000, I think. Uh, FF1 EME, that's a rather different setup. That's been dug up, there's a housing estate on it now, though. Yeah. <laughs> the, the feed point is in the middle. And this is the curved reflector. So the signal starts out from the middle, is pointed at the curved reflector. It bounces off there onto this tilting reflector at the other end and it goes to wherever they want it to. <coughs> so they've got quite a lot of things going on when they have to point that. Um, That's fact, been structured as a housing estate on the <laughs> And in fact the feeds on the carriage that travels backwards and forwards like that and obviously they can tilt that up and down and point it to wherever they want on this reflector. <laughs> That's in France. Now uh, this one's in Greenland. That's been used on 23 sevens EME. Um, recently, well last January, 8-1 EME, that's in Japan. That was used on various bands from 2 metres to 5.7 gigs. Very successful. AD6 I I don't think I've got that one actually. No, I got a slide on that one, yeah. WM6 IFE, uh, that's the Owens Valley Radio Observatory in the States, 140 foot deep. It's going to be a bit expensive, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be, yeah. But if you know somebody who works there, then you've got a bit better chance. You can get the same result if you work there yourself. And you can get the same result as they can. Well, I would get pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So, Magic Moments, here is the first DME stations, obviously. Make it simple in your contacts. First of all, schedule. It's much easier to know that there's going to be somebody there as opposed to transmitting and hoping for the best. Um, random QSOs, work in new countries, work in new content, continents, and hearing your own echoes. So here's some echoes. That's all the sound works. Receiver bandwidth they're using there. That was two and a half k. Two and a half k. It's yeah. standard SSB yeah. transceiver. Yeah. Nothing special. Yeah. That uh, OX two k in green. Thank you. 
raised from there. Box. It's a Tupperware box. 
putting your sandwiches in. Uh, there's a pot in there with a little weight on it, um, and that fed that elevation information back to the um, PC. Um, in fact, you see that, that thing behind, that's a manual elevation indicator. You know, brought it when it's in the can. But uh, basically it's a protractor with a piece of string on it and a, and a weight. And, and that's what I used to use to calibrate the thing with. Can't use an equatorial mount gearbox? You can, yeah. Yeah, but at the time I didn't have it. And, uh, the whole thing was driven by uh, screw threads. So there's a motor on the end of this screw thread that drives it either extends it or she opens it, um, pulling the elevation or pushing it the other way. Um, so in 1989, I decided enough was enough, I'm going to have to build something else. Unfortunately, it took me a while, 2000, to get it finished. <laughs> I'll, I'll just quickly go through these. So I built a hub. Uh, there's basically one of these, one of the webs, one of the struts, and there's one. In fact, I'll tell you what we're looking at there. You can have a look at this later, but uh, this was a prototype, and the, the objective really is to achieve the correct curve for the parabola and to make sure that it doesn't deflect with the wind or under its own weight or anything like that. So if you want to try and grab hold of the end of that, see if you can bend it, then I don't want you to do it. <laughs> yes, I just say how to do it. That's where the dish is going to be planted. So I'm to dig a bloody great hole. There's the old dish behind, and the new one in front. There's the, the mount for the for the new dish. The the tower is a tilt over um, there, so it's like a Strumet. It's actually a Strumet tower. It used to be up at Whitby Abbey um, until it fell down. Um, there's the hub mounted on the on the elevation pivot, and there's the jack. Satellite TV jack, which uh, drives the elevation up and down. That's uh, the same thing again from a different view. Same again. Uh, that's the dish assembled, but there's no reflector on it at that point. Same thing from the back. And that's the first time it went up in the air. Is without the feed, so just a hole at the top where the feed will go. Well, actually, there's a, there's a story, that, story that's similar to that. One day, when I was assembling that, basically the tower is made so it can tilt over, and the, the dish will rotate on its own axis so that I could put all of the bits on from ground level without needing to climb a ladder or having a work platform or anything like that. So this was March 2000. Started putting the ribs on, got called away, had to go out somewhere. My wife was still at home and she rang me up while I was out to say that we've now got a curtain eye in your backyard. <laughs> Curtains where I live. Um, he says, it's spinning around and it's going around so fast I dare put my hands in to stop it. <laughs> <laughs> it, had, it had broke free and the wind was just blow, blowing it around and around. <laughs> um, on the azimuth axis, um, I turned the dish with what used to be a prop pitch motor gearbox. Um, so that's this piece here. On the bottom, that used to be a 28 volt DC motor that took about 20 amps. Took that off. And uh, I re recycled uh, a, an AC motor, 110 volt, out of an old photocopier. And hacked it on 
to the end of that. So that's what turns the dish. Um, as I've indicated, it's actually an incremental encoder in that box. Um, there's a little gear there, which is geared onto this bigger one that's on the, as of the shaft, it's about 8 to 1. So there's me on a nice sunny day, testing preamps. And basically what I'm doing there is, there's a feed, preamps hung on the end, on top of a pair of steps. And basically by pointing at the, pointing the feed at the sky, and then pointing at the ground, we can see a changing noise. And that changing noise will give me an indication as to how good the preamp is. Um, so if we see 7.5 dB changing noise, then the noise figure is going to be about 0.6 dB, something like that. These days you can get way above 8.5, 9 dB. Same again. There we go. There we go. That was in the winter. Yeah, it looks like I've got lots somewhere. <coughs> Two thousand today. There's a dish now. That picture was taken in April, I think, last year. Um, so it's the same dish, but different mesh on it. It's now got stainless steel mesh. Uh, I actually had some problems a uh, year last January, no, last January, January 2006, where the four roofs that hold these feed supports actually broke free from the hull. to take the whole thing down and, and redo parts of it. Um, so it took me about three months to get it sorted in. In doing that, I'll new 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 flats on it. <coughs> the feed's W2 IMU, which is the predecessor to the septum. It's got screws down either side, which have to be tuned correctly. It's a, not an easy job and requires uh, specialist equipment in order to set it up, whereas the septum feed, you can virtually build it and it will work straight out of the box. When you say work straight out of the box, what do you build it from the plan? Or? Well, it's been, been designed by people who are experts, <coughs> and there's been that many of them built now that, you know, everybody knows that they work first time. Uh, they may not be the ultimate in feeds, but they always work. Um, software I use for tracking is F1EHN. Mine's a later version than that, but that just gives you an illustration. Basically, this, this world map gives you an indication as to where in the world you can work people. So, anywhere that's not in a shaded area. Um, this is where the dish is pointing. That's how much Doppler shift you can expect on 23 sems on your own echoes. Um, um, that's where the moon is, that's where the antenna is, that's where. And this is a sky map which gives you an indication as to what, how hot the sky is at the point that you're pointing at. Um, problem is, if the moon is very close to the sun for instance, the sun generates that much noise that you, you can't hear anything. Um, if I point my dish at the sun, I see about 18 dBs of sun noise. Um, so you've only got to be within 3 degrees either side, and there's so much noise that you just can't hear anything. And if you're using a smaller dish, the problem gets worse, because the beam width is wider. So you always avoid that time during the month when the sun is close to the moon. What are the shaded areas again? Shaded areas are where, where the people can't see the moon. So anywhere that's not shaded is where you can see the moon at that time. Um, obviously, as the moon's tra travelling across the sky, 
this unshaded area is going to travel to the west. So, moonrise in the east, you work the JAs, the ZLs, the VKs, yeah? And it's travelling towards the south. You can work all the Russians and Europeans, South Africans and all of those people. Um, and by the time we get to the south, the Americans are coming through. Does it work really very early on, actually, like, because I'm normally in check? Um, not really. The, the moon's got to be above the horizon for oh, the station to be able to work anybody. So there isn't a point below the horizon where it will work. Um, on, on the HF, it's like just a little bit in between, like, you know, it's just starting to rise. Yeah. But the, the other problem is, of course, that most people have got obstructions that they're in, which they can't avoid. So the moon's got to be maybe 10 degrees up before they, they, they can hit it anyway. Uh, there's very few stations that have got a clear horizon, east and west. You know, you mentioned about the noise figures yeah. uh, regarding the sun. How, how does that relate to working different frequencies with bum bounce, you know, with solar noise? Um, the problem gets worse as you go down, uh, because the big width gets wider on all your antennas going down in frequency. Um, as you go higher, the problem actually gets better because the beam widths are a lot smaller. But there will be a point, obviously, where the moon is so close to the sun that you can't escape it. And obviously the worst extent of that is when you've got an eclipse. Um, that's the interface that goes out to the back of the PC. But, um, tries to dish and feeds position information back. So was it all worthwhile? Well, I think so. Um, <coughs> both building the system and making it work and getting the results on the air. Activity is actually on the increase on the 23-7 band. On the lower bands, it seems to be on the decrease. And I don't know why that is. Um, some people blame JT65. Um, since I went on the air with a new dish, I've added 212 initials. So considering I started out working 81 over 20 years, then that's a massive difference. Completed works, I'll continue. South America was one that always eluded me. And it wasn't until I got the new dish up that I made worked all continents. Great success working QRP stations with JT65. Won the Italian contest several times. Won the worldwide EME marathon several times. Won the Dubas EME contest once in 2002. Won the AWRL EME contest in 2006. Um, this year, or well, last year, I made 97 CWR SSB contacts in the AWRL contest for 20K265. I think I might have won it again. But this time, it's, um, what do they call it? Unassisted. So I'm, I'm operating unassisted this time, whereas in 2006, I actually went on a logger for about 10 minutes to work somebody on a sketch but not in the contest, so I had to declare that I was assisting. So, first of 23 sounds, these are all the countries that I've made first contacts with. Uh, all the ones on the left were on CW. These, these lot here were all on JT65, and most of those, apart from the TF, were. Well, the TF, forget that for a minute. All the ones about the TF and the BY were um, on the 59 element Yagi DL3 OCH. TF was uh, with TF stroke DL1 YMK with this 3.6 metre expedition dish. It's a stress dish that you, you can take on an aeroplane. 
Now you can get it out of the box when it gets there. Direct the whole thing within a few hours, and he's on the air. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, BY was DL3 LC8, but he was using the 1.8 meter dish supplied by the Chinese. He was the 981. 981 AS. <coughs> the one next, a more fun. We're working on a 13 turn system at the moment. Uh, I've got the transverter, I've got PA 250 watt solid state. Uh, I've got a feed, I just need to build a preamp and a few other bits to get it on the dish. Since 2000, the only enclosure I've had for all the stuff up at the feed has been a black dustbin bag. Well, actually, there's a dog feed bag underneath that. But, uh, <laughs> so, sometime I might get around to putting it in a box so that the weather doesn't get in. But in the meantime, I have to keep changing the bags. Upgrade connectors are 7 sixteenths. 7 sixteenths from N types. Um, I'm only really talking about the transmit side because N types get hot on 23 sevens when you push 600 watts through them. So obviously there's some loss. And on a short piece of cable like that with an end type on the end, I measured 25 watts loss in the shaft. So it's quite important to get rid of as much as you can. More power. Where's that power go? One of these is good for 2,000 watts. It's a TH347. It comes out of a, an old TV transmitter. This one, I think it came from the island mole. I've got the cavity that goes with it. There will be more of these because as they're changing out all the old analogue stuff for digital, all the old valve amplifiers will be coming out. So they'll be chucked in the skip most of them. So if you know somebody who works for Crown Castle or MTL or whatever, then that's the place to start. Extend the dish. I had plans, I actually built the dish and took it away and extend it. On the end, there's a, there is actually two pieces of angle, one that side and one this side. And the intention was to bolt on to more to extend it by another metre or so. So that's two metres on the diameter. But, I don't think I'll do that. If you did that, what, uh, what gear would that give you, do you think? Well, doubling the size gives you 16 B more gain. So you'd have to work it out, but it's not doubling the size. So it'd probably be about 3, three B more. So that's it. Hopefully someday I might know the telly bit more. <laughs> I think a lot of them won't know what JT65 is. Could you say something about it? Right. Yeah, I can actually show you some stuff. Depends. Obviously, you've got to watch the moon. 
Um, when the moon is highest in the sky, that's when you get the maximum time to operate. Um, and if you've got a good view of the moon from the east to the west, then it could be as much as 14 hours. Really? Yeah. You don't have to keep them short. No, no, you can. You can. Does that make any difference working boom, in the day, depending where the sun is, in taking respect the solar light and working at night? Um, it doesn't make any difference day or night, providing the sun's not anywhere close, like within five degrees, then you can forget about it. Uh, the only problem you got is on moonrise and moonset. So, for instance, if I want to work with ZL, I've got about 30 minutes to work ZL. And I've got maybe an hour and a half to work some VKs. The guy in Tasmania, I might be only working for an hour. Um, it's not different to HS, really, is it? I mean, no. You've, no. Only got a, you've got a short time scale in which to do that kind of That's thing. Right. That's right. right. Yeah. So it's a case of just picking your time and knowing how it works. You've got different power limitations to the, to the rest of this, of this mode. Uh, no. no I've actually got a, a special research permit which allows me to run a kilowatt right. at the feed. But I can't get anything like a kilowatt at the feed. No, no, no. I've got 600 watts in the shack. That's what prompted me to ask you the question when you yeah. said you were for instance under what? Yeah. Uh, 600 watts in the shack produces about 400 at the same. Sure. So, so, don't you use machine modes for power to check and things like that? No. Why not? That, that would be. Well, everybody transmits at different speeds. There is no protocol that anybody follows for move out for CW. So it's all. Uh, and they use, they use machine, like machine modes for, uh, for uh, meter scans, don't they? Yeah, they do. Yeah, so very fast, high speed stuff. And then once you, once you start computerising it, obviously you can use well, that's the right. things. Well, that's where the JT65 comes in. Because basically, um, instead of transmitting a carrier on and off, as you do with Moscow, it transmits different tones. So it transmits um, a sync tone, and then it transmits a function tone, which is a character and then it transmits a sick tone, then a function tone, and so on, for a minute. Um, and it's all done, you know, accurately. Both stations have to have synchronised time on their PCs. Um, and, you know, it works. But um, the difficulty with it is the double shift. And that comes where I'm in a beam wave. And I've a, a proper equatorial. Well, the Doppler shift is, is about the rate of movement of the moon itself yeah. relative to the Earth. So the Doppler shift on the rise is big. When it's when the moon's to the south, there's virtually none. Um, so first problem you got is knowing, trying to work out what the Doppler shift of the station you want to receive is with this system because the bandwidth of KT65 is about 5 hertz. So, you need, you need to be able to tune your receiver to exactly the right frequency, or at least within 600 hertz, to be able to see it on a waterfall, and then tune your receiver to exactly the right frequency before you can do any decoding. And that, that's the biggest problem everybody's got. Nobody knows for sure what frequency they're on unless they're locked to a standard of some kind like GPS or a standard or something like that. Um, and that's why most people fail uh, because they can't find the signals. If they can actually listen to JT65 on GB3 VHF, too much a beacon, yeah. and you'll hear that, and you can tune it in and you resolve it. Yeah. So, that's that's quite easy. It's quite good. Because I, I tried first time I ever listened to it. I heard it quite, and then I turned my beam to it, disappeared totally, and I left my computer on all night. Next morning I come back, it's yeah. there every minute with yeah. the same information. Yeah. We couldn't even hear it. The computer can't. You don't listen to the size of the dishes. I know some of them could be quite small, but others are quite large. Yeah. Thumb yeah. permission. Yeah. Do you have problems with that? I didn't. No. But um, 
I was quite lucky in that my neighbour on the right hand side didn't exist, the house was empty. On the left hand side he was the deputy mayor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, no, he's got to go on the support, hasn't he? He, he, didn't, care, he didn't care less. Um, but all the people who live either side were actually written to, and nobody complained. Mm -hmm. So it went to. Do you have TBI issues? No. Not on 23 cents. Do you have anything to do with Skype? No. Sure. Yeah. Because <laughs> they have issues too. Yeah. The, on, the only thing that I cause problems with are depth phones. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> if I have my depth phone in the shack, I'm disconnected while I'm transmitting. Um, I just cannot use it while I'm transmitting for some reason. It loses connection with the base station. Uh, so you've got 600 watts in the shack. Yeah. Well, that three was that. Before we go to the area. Exactly. <laughs> you did your work on 2.3, but you don't think it'll do any better on the higher than that. But you, um, you haven't tried it for deep space stuff, have you? Any of the I haven't made it on 8 gigs yet. But in theory, if I've done the profiling right, um, it should be accurate, accurate enough to go to 10 gigs. Um, and the mesh is 8 inch mesh. So there's going to be virtually no feed through on 10 gigs even. It's a tenth of a wave. Well, when I've worked you, have you been on that dish then? Yeah. Needless to say, it's very loud. <laughs> But he points it, even points it to the hills here from Gainsborough. <laughs> it's quite loud. <laughs> I, I, I 